there were some believers and some non-believers. We used to have uh, sightings where a fin might be seen cruising past, which probably at the time was a little bit unbelievable. Those stories became a legend. Over a period of time with a lot of people reporting these sightings, uh, I guess it became known that there must be something there. After weeks of tall tales, this picture emerges. And that, that picture made it into the local paper and gave the, the legend story a little bit more substance. If you're probably thinking it's a bit of a crazy story to have uh, large sharks just hanging around in a lake on a golf course. Scott Wagstaff is one of a growing number of people who find sharks where they least expect them. I think the reality is until you see the shark for yourself for the first time, uh, it's very difficult to believe the story. It doesn't make a lot of sense, really. Rumors of golf course sharks swirl. Course manager Scott Wagstaff investigates. He figures any shark stuck in a lake may be hungry. Within minutes, a shark shows itself. I'm so excited because I can't believe I've finally got this, this video footage of a shark. I'm literally only probably two metres away from the shark at this point. It was so close. Shark biologist Jasmine Graham has spent hundreds of hours studying sharks. The fact of the matter is, you just don't know where a shark might show up. Then the mystery deepens. Experts like Jasmine can identify individual sharks by their fins. The shark fin in the first picture is different to the one in Scott's video. There may be two sharks. Experts move in and gather more evidence. What they discover shocks everyone. There's not one or two golf course predators, but seven different sharks. Everyone that came and played our golf course wanted to wanted that opportunity to see a shark fin as they play. That sort of became, uh, that became the thing here. You know, did you see the shark today? Um. There he is there, look. Wow. <laughs> the golfers here now know um, that's somewhere where you leave your ball to rest and you don't go and try and retrieve it for obvious reasons. Um, the uh, value of someone's life is probably not worth a, a golf ball. Biologists identify the intruders, bull sharks. Bull sharks are one of the three most dangerous species. They have one of the strongest bite forces of all sharks. No problem biting through a golf club or even a golfer. Most notably, Bull sharks have a special adaptation. They can tolerate fresh water. Basically, the big issue as to why certain animals can't go in fresh water is that their bodies are too salty, and so they actually get a rush of water into their bodies, into their cells, that causes them basically to burst. But uh, bull sharks and some other sharks actually have the ability to regulate the salt content in their own bodies so that they can stay level with the environment. That allows these bull sharks to survive in a water hazard on a golf course and to multiply. On a couple of occasions, I've had some shark experts come and, and view the sharks. They believe, because of the size of some of the sharks, that the only way they could have got into the lake was through a breeding. The remaining mystery is how the parents got here in the first place. Almost every year, the golf course is devastated by floods. Nearby riverbanks can't contain the water, so the sharks have an open path. 
Whenever there's weather events, uh, sharks usually can sense the change in barometric pressure, so they know whenever big storms are coming. So usually they're gonna move into areas where they're at less risk, which is probably how these bull sharks ended up in the pond in the first place, trying to get out of the path of the storm. When the floodwaters recede, some bull sharks have nowhere to go and wind up stranded in suburbia. But the sharks on the golf course found a lake deep enough to keep swimming. What storms bring in, they can also take away. A more recent flood may have thinned the shark numbers at the 14th hole. Now, we haven't seen the sharks in the lake for a little while, but I'm not going in for a swim to find out if they're still there. I can't walk past the lake without scanning it for the chance of seeing a, a thin break the surface. There could very well be a shark in the lake behind me right now. Sharks are invading unexpected places. Oh, my god. No one expects to see a great white shark in a swimming pool. Swarms of them at our feet. Creeks, lakes, backyards. Oh, my God. They come close for a reason. And now, it's time to find out why. Greerder River is a paradise for water lovers. This estuary is a feeding ground for fish like Cobb and Grunter shark food. 30 miles up this pristine waterway, holiday maker Simon Van Helstingen and his friends have spent the day swimming and now hope to catch a few big ones. We go to the Breda River every year and we just chill on the boat, chatting, having a laugh, rods are in the water and good fish. I mean, we catch, probably catching a grunt every 10 minutes. So it's, it's good fun and it's all catch and release. So so we put them back and really just uh, just a fun outing and until uh, yeah until it got a little bit more serious <laughs> basically i hooked into a fish i was fighting it bringing it up to the boat and then when it was really really close to the boat i saw a massive swirl of water behind the fish and and realized oh, that's definitely not <laughs> not a fish so I, I told my friend just to grab my phone and start filming but film it, film it. i'm filming i'm filming that's what the bomb was. Oh, wait, 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 it's coming back. All of a sudden, when this shark takes this this rod, I mean, there's absolutely nothing you can do. It's uh, just holding it and it's just singing. That reel is absolutely singing, basically like a boat had hooked the line and just <laughs> stripped it clear. We were just standing there in shock. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> we were so far away from the ocean, the last thing I expected is a giant shark stealing my fish. I mean, I was swimming this morning, I was in the water. <laughs> I will never get in this water! And that right there is the Bitter River. Oh, oh my gosh. This shark swims in a sleepy backyard waterway for a reason. Renowned shark biologist Allison Towner studies predatory behavior in sharks of all sizes. Bull sharks are definitely demonstrating a level of sophistication in their behavior here because they're working out that by sitting and waiting for a fisherman to make a catch, they're doing half of the work for them, and then therefore they can just take an easy kill. The sharks catch on to easy meals at the end of fishing lines. Sharks are very intelligent animals. They get these
stimuli that indicate this prey is going to be easy, it's injured, it's sick, but they also can be trained and we've shown this in science that they actually can be trained to go to specific targets so they can adapt to knowing, hey, this is a place that I know that I can get this food. Just how far upstream a bull shark will go for food is anyone's guess. In some cases, far enough to invade someone else's turf. In the heart of Isimangaliso Wetland Park, one of the wildest places on Earth, the river teems with dangerous animals. Hippos are the world's deadliest large land animals, responsible for around 500 human deaths a year. Crocodiles have a bad rep, too. Adventurers Bevan and Jill Langley are prepared for both. There is something else lurking in the water. Such shark encounters appear to be getting more and more common. Local guide Stacy Funvig was there when one turned into an attack. I see my hippo family, but suddenly there was a bit of a splash. I can see the hippos are getting agitated. They're splashing, they're making a noise. <gasps> I'm actually getting nervous for the shark now. I'm not sure what's happening. And then all of a sudden, the hippo must have got quite a big fright, and uh, the mother hippo reacted and tried to run after the shark. But because the water was so shallow at that time, the shark didn't actually disappear. It, in fact, went the opposite direction and went onto the mud. And then more than one hippo started chasing the shark. Two of the world's deadliest animals vie for the same territory. gets off with a warning, but leaves both hippos and humans puzzled by its presence. In a remarkable twist, it may be the hippos that brought the shark here in the first place. The sharks were hungry, and as we know, hippos go to the toilet in the water, and the best place for young fish to, to, to feed is by the hippos. So the shark was getting a little bit brave, and he decided to go to the hippos to try and get something to eat. And we know hippos have a little bit of a short temper, and being bumped by a shark and woken up to see those teeth, I think the hippo got a bit of a fright, and he reacted uh, and started chasing the shark around. Bull sharks hunting around hippos may seem bizarre, but food tempts even the smartest of beasts. 
On the other side of the planet, big sharks with a bad reputation also get close to home. Then closer. Then even closer. First, the Magnuson family prepares for a day of fishing for small mackerel. Before they leave the inlet, oh my god! Oh my god! A great white shark, maybe 13 Whoa, feet I'm long. I'm videoing right now. What? Holy, that's you. We were just talking about my mind is like right on it. Oh my god! Look at the size of it. Look at him. He could tip the boat over. Look at him. Marine scientist Carly Jackson is used to being surrounded by big sharks. Even she finds the Magnuson video unnerving, but not surprising. That shark's head was like bigger than their boat. So <laughs> sharks usually can't really tell what's going on at the surface and they'll need to come up and investigate. It isn't interested in the baited hook. As quick as it appears, it vanishes. Just when holiday makers at Cape Cod think a shark can't get any closer, one does. Swimmers regularly enjoy the tranquil salt ponds of the area. They seem as safe as a swimming pool. And they are, unless there's a shark invasion. Around the world, great whites are known as open ocean travelers. They feed in deep water and breach from below. But somehow, this 14-foot giant gets into a pond used for leisure. And perhaps strangest of all, it won't leave. Big sharks get trapped for a lot of reasons. It could be that the tide was high enough at the time for them to swim into the area, and maybe they were chasing prey, and then the tide goes down and the water level drops, and then suddenly this animal doesn't have enough water to get through the area that it came through initially. It settles in for the day. Then the week. Then two weeks. Residents call in experts to get it out. But everyone is stumped. You can't control a 14-foot great white shark. The scientists tag her so they can track her movements beyond the pond. They find a possible exit point and lay nets to guide her out. But she refuses to go. A shark that big can do whatever it wants to. Fresh bait doesn't entice her out either. They try to catch her, but fail. Finally, they bring in the big guns, water cannons. The shark very slowly but surely moves away from all of the noise, and, it, and they're actually able to steer it by using, I guess, the boats and the high-pressure hoses to, uh, to guide it back out into the ocean. Sixteen days later, the pond is again shark-free. But before anyone can relax, another white shark gets even closer. Out of the water. Oh my god. And onto the beach. It's a great white invasion. This youngster is alive, but in trouble after the receding tide left it stranded. Unable to breathe on land, 
locals work fast to help it back into the water. Don't get in the water, you guys. Don't get too close. They're incredibly inquisitive animals. Even juvenile great whites have this, almost this curiosity that, that's never satisfied. This curious shark swims off to make a full recovery. But this usually open ocean species leaves behind a perplexing question. Why are they so close to people in Cape Cod? New science reveals a startling fact. White sharks are seen more and more off the coast of Massachusetts in shallow water. And a lot of the scientists think that that's because the seals are coming in closer. And so they're, they're adapting to that. And they are going after the seals. They're seeing stingrays. Uh, and so they're getting more and more comfortable going into shallow water because as the climate changes, as fishing pressures increase, they really have to go for whatever food is most available and easy to get to. While here, these sharks spend half their time in water less than 15 feet deep. Quite often it's startling to humans when they see these massive predators right along the beaches where effectively most of us could wade into at waist deep and see them. Great whites are more versatile than anyone ever imagined here at Cape Cod and beyond. Good friends Dale Pearson and Eric Mack return from a shopping trip and see something big in the shallows right in front of their house. I look over and I see this gigantic black tail like coming out of the water. It's, it's, it's massive. It looks like it's just like a whale, like a baby whale that's got itself beached right there. So I stop the car, we're looking at it. He jumps out of the car and goes running down to see what it is. I drive up to the house and grab my phone so I can record it. So I'm gonna record us going down to save this baby whale. And I'm running down there now and as I get closer, I'm getting closer, I'm realizing that this baby whale is not a whale. I think that's a white shark. That's a, that might be a white shark, bro. Holy That's a white shark, dude. Huge freaking shark, bro. It's a shark, and it's not just a shark, it's a very, very big shark. Holy it's a white shark for sure. Holy There's a giant white shark. There's my house. I've been living down there for, you know, on and off for a couple decades. I taught my children how to swim in that bay in front of the house. I've been there multiple times in bad water, and I don't want to believe that I'm looking at a great white shark. This was the last place I ever expected to or even wanted to see a great white shark, let alone a massive great white shark. Standing right there next to a shark that big, you can feel its power. We have never seen anything that would lead us to believe that that kind of a predator was right there in the water in front of the house. Holy this thing's huge. Oh my gosh. Holy I'm shaking. The reason for this up-close visit has nothing to do with a storm or a receding tide. Looks like it's been hit. So on this top of the shark, a really large gash about eight inches long and maybe about three inches deep right behind the dorsal fin. As he starts to move away from me and flex his tail, I notice blood coming out of the wound. Whenever sharks get injured, their first thought is self-preservation. It is 
get as far away from anything that might eat me or hurt me. Holy shit. And so a lot of times injured sharks will go up into canals or shallow water to kind of recuperate. Sharks do have the amazing ability to heal extremely quickly. So really all they need to do is stay alive, stay fed, and then just get a couple of days to heal before they can go back out and resume their normal behavior. They can regenerate their flesh at rates far faster than most marine mammals are capable of, for example. But what they need to do, of course, is conserve energy to be able to trade off that whole healing process, which is energetically expensive. The injured great white moves around in the shallows for the next few days before it heads into the deep. Injury is a key reason why a shark may show up on your doorstep. And it's not just great whites that seek refuge. A thresher shark invades the shallows. The most dangerous thing about a thresher shark is its tail. It uses its tail to stun its prey, and that's just really dangerous for both fish and for humans. This thresher shark is clearly not hunting. Like the great white, it needs to recover from an injury. Uh, left fin is fine, right fin is gone. Half of the shark's pectoral fin is missing, possibly from a boat strike or a bite from a bigger shark. Its chances of survival are high Sharks have more genes dedicated to blood clotting and growing new tissue than any other fish, bird, or mammal. So that quick recovery is really an evolutionary advantage that allows them to get back out there after a major injury very quickly. Bye, buddy. Hope you find your way back into the ocean. Bull sharks can invade a golf course after a storm and follow the food chain to the back step of Riverside Homes. Oh, 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 my, oh, I will never get in this water. Great whites will come in close out of curiosity. Oh my God. Or to recover from injury. But there are even bigger sharks invading even stranger places. An unexpected visitor draws a crowd. I see this massive shadow swimming around in a harbor and all of these members of the public in awe of it. And for a split second, you can't help but think, is it a white shark? It swims perilously close to families with children. But on closer inspection, by looking at its slow, docile behavior, its large, gaping, wide open mouth, we can see it's a basket shark. It's the second biggest shark in the world. The basking shark is one of three species of shark that feed on plankton and clouds of plankton bring this giant into the harbor for a three-hour visit. Sharks are opportunistic feeders, so whenever they're hungry and there's an easy meal nearby, they're definitely going to take that up. Food can bring in one big shark or a swarm of smaller ones. A man-made intertidal zone now writhes with 150 sharks. Hound sharks. These bottom-dwelling hunters are true to their name, gathering in a pack 
like hounds. Their flat teeth can crush shell and bone. So this is an example of a whole bunch of smoothhound sharks in the UK feeding on small crab species. Such invasions are on the uptick, and we may be to blame. In a small creek right behind a string of homes in South Africa, a shiver of more than 30 large sharks. You're a ex. The sharks are far from an ocean inlet. I just see the bull sharks or what? Common for bull sharks, but these are not bulls. Holy moose. Hound sharks again. And what we see this time is an escape plan. Well, smooth hound sharks are known to be very thermally sensitive animals. If water gets too cold too quickly, it can also be an environmental cue to vacate the area, which then caused the smooth hounds to enter the river to escape the very, very cold water in the bay. The unseasonally cold water may have been caused by man-made climate change. Elsewhere, our role in causing shark invasions is clearer. Local resident Janelle Branauer notices something bizarre in her backyard key. I saw tips of fins, hundreds of tips of fins, and it was amazing. It was like, what is this? You know, is this Armageddon? You know, we frequently see fish in our canal. We see dolphins, we see manatee, but never ever have we seen sharks. And literally, there was hundreds of them. Like, you maybe could have walked across the canal on the backs of these sharks. That's how many sharks were in our canal. It was amazing. Initially, I first see bonnethead sharks. And they're three to four feet, which was concerning. But when I see the larger species of fish, including the lemon sharks and the nurse sharks, I know that there is something going on that's not right. This is not normal. The cause is around the corner. Chemical spills and runoffs in the area contribute to one of the worst red tides, an algae bloom, in 50 years. It sucks oxygen out of the water and spreads through Tampa Bay. They're suffocating. They have no oxygen, so they're in search of oxygenated water, and that's what brings them to this canal that's on my doorstep. Man, this is craziness. Another red tide. Sharks in our backyards are becoming more common than ever. Weather, food, tides, and turmoil. All can place a shark in a body of water near you. The question is, what should we do about it? An unlikely answer can be found in Sydney, Australia. When real estate agent Melissa Hathier hears about a shark in her local Oceanside swimming pool. I'm at home, it's a regular October morning, beautiful sunny day, and the phone rings and it's mum. And mum's saying, there's a shark in the rock pool. What? No. What's a shark doing in the rock pool? And I said, let's go. Nan needs help. We get down there, and there's a bit of a crew down there, and we finally see him. And I said, Mum, someone's got to help him. I'm going to get in. And she's like, you're not getting in that pool with that shark. And I said, no, I am. So I'm just going to go watch, because I could see he was only, you know, about a metre long. And I thought, he's not going to hurt me. Let's just swim around and see what he's doing. It's a blind shark, a type of carpet shark endemic to the east coast of Australia that can actually see very well. It only closes its eyes when out of the water. Flat teeth and a vice grip can crush shell and bone. When he comes past me, 
I'm realizing he's really quite distressed because he's kind of doing laps of this rock pool. He's bumping into the rocks. And I'm thinking, the poor baby, you know, he's just stuck. So he's washed in with a really super high tide and now it's low tide and he's probably thinking, how do I get out of here? And I thought, okay, if I can get a grip around your neck at some point where you can't twist around and bite me, I think we're going to be okay. I took him straight over to the side and checked first, is there plenty of water on the other side? There was, threw him back over and then it was just like celebrate. I was, I was so happy that I did it. Melissa didn't end up in the emergency room, but life and limb are more at risk when it's a deadly shark in your pool. It's another beautiful morning in Sydney for a swim in the local pool. Not today. Manly Pool has been closed by a great white. And animal rescue expert Hope Nugent is on the scene. There is hundreds of people around this pool. Everyone's on looking, absolute fascination. It's not every day that you see a great white shark in a swimming pool. Big crowds gather to get a glimpse of one of the ocean's apex predators swimming just feet away. How this great white came to invade this local pool is a surprising story of shark compassion. It started with a call to rescue. Initially, the report came through as a mako shark had washed up on the beach. Upon arrival, there was that moment of, of shock at the realization that it wasn't in fact a mako shark, it was, you know, a, a great white. It was obvious it was in a really bad way and it needed help. It was too weak to battle the surf zone, just needed to get him into some still water so that he could continue to swim, rest, and the closest still water was the oceanic pool just around the corner. And most people, when they hear the words shark coming through, they move out of the way. Whenever you have animals in a small space where they can't escape and they're under stress, they're a lot more likely to lash out than they would be if they were able to swim away. So when you have that fight or flight, if they can't flee, if they can't get away, their next option is to fight, which is where negative interactions can happen. We were there in the water with the animal to guide it away from the concrete structure so it didn't do any further damage to its body. It never even factored into my thinking that because this animal was considered potentially dangerous or deadly that I wouldn't assist it. In recent years, more than 50% of all fatal shark attacks occurred in Australia. But this shark isn't demonized. It's saved. The majority of people at the scene, they, they are fascinated. They're, they're wanting to ask questions. They're wanting to know what's going on. Um, you know, it's not every day that a great white shark washes up in their backyard on their, on their local beach. The shark at Manly was placed in the pool by humans, rescued, then returned to sea. It's a different take on what to do when sharks invade our space. But in South Africa, it comes with a warning. Proceed with caution. Here, another great white shark clashes with locals. Lifesaver Rico Kuhn surfs and works in this ocean every day. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. It's turning from low tide to high tide. Uh, so it's pulling back and pushing up at the same time. It's a very dangerous time of day. And uh, it's spring tide, so it's very, very big swell um, coming in. These surfers are used to seeing sharks. The relationship between sharks and surfers is really interesting. Surfers spend a lot of time in the ocean. They're, they're really excited and passionate about conserving the ocean because they use it so heavily. 
But because surfers are in the ocean a lot, they have more negative interactions with, with sharks. Nobody expects what comes next. My co-worker is walking there patrolling, and then I, I see him coming, running back to me, and he's calling, there's a shark, there's a shark, you must come, you must come. And so I, I started running there. I see the shark is laying there in the, on the rocks. It's bleeding, it's hurting itself, um, and something needs to be done now. Dude, it's gonna, it's gonna die, bro. How are we gonna get out? You know, when I saw the shark, uh, I saw it's not the usual sharks that we see. We see uh, pajama sharks and the shy kind of sharks quite often just coming into the bay for a little rest. But uh, when I saw the shark, I saw, no, this thing is massive, this thing is powerful. So um, I think once I got to it, I realized, you know, this is, this is a great white. When I saw those eyes, you know, those pitch black eyes, I realized this is a great white. The shark is at the surfer's mercy. If they leave it to fend for itself, death is almost certain. The tide pushes it further up the rocks and the shark can't breathe. Sharks can survive out of water for varying lengths of time. If we're talking about a larger shark, like a white shark or a hammerhead, we're talking about a couple of minutes. I do believe that this young shark was just foraging for food. It probably ended up navigating too shallow. Perhaps a rip current or some kind of stream just pushed it into an area that was basically rocky with the tide going out. It was bad luck on the shark's part. I think some people, some were scared because they realized, you know, Victoria Bay is usually a safe bay, and now there's great whites there. While it's not a huge shark, its presence calls for urgent action. It's, it's cutting itself. Check, it's bleeding everywhere. Rico is compelled to help. The tide forces the shark back towards the beach. We don't want the shark to die. How do we save the shark without it biting us? You can put on my board. One slip and Rico's hand could end in a mouthful of teeth made for slicing. It feels dangerous to hold the white shark, but in the moment, saving it outweighs the risk. <laughs> Hopefully it will be grateful and just stay out of the lineup for now. Don't worry about it, body And it's a white. Is it swimming? It's out. When I did pick up the shark and hear the bystanders freaking out, I, I remember just realizing what I'm actually doing right now. And uh, when the shark smiled at me and I saw those teeth, <laughs> I gained a healthy respect uh, that this is a predator and not something to be messed with. Dangerous predators at our feet. Sometimes due to natural events, Rising tides, storms, the hunt for food, or injury. Other times, because we unwittingly invite them with a changing climate and pollution. They need to escape life-threatening situations. Sharks don't seek us out, but they are coming closer. And when they show up, we can cringe in fear or try to set things right and lend a helping hand. The choice is ours. <laughs>